Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's book talk about the disappearance of Joseph Mengele. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the public programs coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibition, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from photographer Martin Scholler, which is running through June 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. Uh, we appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. If you want to get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat, in addition to all the links I've mentioned. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Today, we are honored to be joined by Olivier uh, Guez and Sam Sachs. Olivier is the author of novels and essays translated into more than 30 languages, including American Spleen, Praise of Dodging, and The Revolutions of Jacques Coscas. His book, The Disappearance of Joseph Mangala, was the recipient of the 2017 Prix Renaudot. It has been translated worldwide and is currently being adapted for the screen. He is also the co-author of the screenplay Fritz Bauer, a German hero, for which he won the 2016 German Oscar for Best Script. As a journalist, he has contributed to Le Monde, Point, The New York Times, The Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, and The Courrier de Acera. He has lived in England, Nicaragua, Brussels, Berlin, and Paris, and currently lives in Rome. Sam is the fiction critic at the Wall Street Journal. His reviews have also appeared in Harper's, The London Review of Books, The New Republic, and Commentary. You can buy The Disappearance of Joseph Mangala at the link in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now I'd like to welcome Olivier and Sam. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Great. Are we all queued up? I think so. Yeah. Well, let's start. Um, let's start by sort of talking about what we're talking about, the nature of what sort of book this is. Um, I find that this is something that we Americans are more uh, fixated on maybe than the French are. This book is sometimes labeled a novel, sometimes might be considered a narrative nonfiction, I think is a term you use. So before we get into it, do you have a preferred label or does it not really matter what it is? When you were working on it, what, what was the nature of the genre that you felt you were working in? I mean, what matters for me is that uh, was to to tell the story of uh, of Mengele in South America. I mean, considering that the um, I mean, in the title of the book, you have the name of Joseph Mengele. I had to 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 respect this, and I had to respect the readers. I had to respect my, myself also. So this is the story of Joseph Mengele in uh, South America. So it's you can say it's a narrative nonfiction, or it's a nonfiction written like a novel, which is more or less the same. And some parts, some bits are uh, fictionalized. This is true because, I mean, we will never know all the details of Mengele's life in South America. He stayed there for for thirty years, and uh, so basically, I'm I'm describing the trajectory of Mengele in South America. And uh, so there are a few things that I added or that I trend. I wouldn't say I transformed. But I give you a few examples to be very clear. Um, the relationship between Eichmann and Mengele is, is a crucial one in the book, and uh, their meeting is a is a true turning point. No one knows uh, where they met, which date exactly, what was the I mean the whole setting. So I work as a kind of film director for this, and there is a very famous German restaurant in uh, Buenos Aires called uh, ABC. And uh, this place used to be, I mean, lots of former Nazis who lived in Buenos Aires loved to, to come and eat at the uh, ABC. So I've decided to, to settle. That, that's the set of the, the meeting of Eichmann and Mengele. So this is little things. Uh, another example, when Mengele moves to Brazil, 
he lives uh, 15 years with an Hungarian family. And he has an affair with uh, the Hungarian lady, with the lady of the family. And no one knows any details about this, of course, who started, when, how, how long it lasted, and so on. But it, it's a it's a crucial uh, element to understand why he stays so long and why the separation was so tense, and so on. So uh, again, as a film director, I've uh, I've kind of organized the set of the meeting and of the relationship. That's the kind of things that I added as a novelist, but otherwise it's a true narrative nonfiction. Understood. And you give us the, the framework. You're, you, the book begins with Mengele arriving in Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. it ends with his death, or in fact it ends, there's an epilogue that uh, concerns the exhumation of his corpse in order for people to figure out that it actually was him, they can confirm that he actually did die. Mm -hmm. um, there's a flashback to the period that he's most notorious for his 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 role in Auschwitz, but that's not the focus of what you dramatize. Why did you choose to take the period that you did rather than what he is most notorious for? Because I mean, there are so many books about Mengele in Auschwitz and so many books about the concentration camps, and I, I wouldn't have been able to write a narrative nonfiction or with some. I mean, you have testimonies which will ever be stronger than anything else. So even then, the, the best writer in the world will never achieve what testimonies. And uh, so I wouldn't, uh, that was not the point. What was the point, in fact, was to, to describe the second life of Mengele. And uh, there were lots of mysteries about his, uh, this life. Um, Mengele arrived in, as you said, in Buenos Aires in 1949, and he died in Brazil 30 years later. This is very long. And uh, so first, basically, I wanted to understand what exactly happened, how this guy survived, why was he never caught, what did the Mossad, what did the CIA, what did the German secret services, the Argentinians, the Brazilians, and so on and so on. Who helped him? How did he survive? So uh, that was my main focus at the, at the beginning. And also, um, Mengele, from the beginning of the 60s became a kind of uh, pop figure culture, yeah. uh, a pop figure, pop, pop culture figure, sorry. Um, after the trial of uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem and after the trial of Auschwitz in, uh, in Frankfurt in Germany, Mengele was very known. And uh, so many books were written about him and many movies also. I mean, two big, 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 big movie blockbusters of the time in the 70s uh, were made about Mengele. And the first one is The Boys from Brazil with Gregory Peck. And the other one is, of course, Marathon Man. And even if it's not really the story of Mengele, I mean, everybody thought about that was the role model, in fact, that was. And uh, also novels, and also Simon Wiesenthal, for instance, wrote things about Mengele. And what he wrote was completely wrong. I mean, he, he describes Mengele in a 1967 book as a villain in a James Bond. I mean, the guy lives in Asuncion, in a big hacienda, he's surrounded by beautiful women. Uh, he has a big, he drives a big, dark Mercedes. He goes to the fancy bars and he drinks and he has a weapon on him and a gun and all of this. And this is a James Bond imagination. It's like Dr. No or uh, Goldfinger. <laughs> that was nothing to do with Mengele. So basically, I wanted to to do, I mean, to to dig on these mysteries and also to to contradict all the, the the legends about this guy. I mean, Mengele was called the Angel of Death. I mean, when you think about such an expression, the Angel of Death, it's like a Marvel expression, the yeah. super villain, and he was a super villain, of course, in Auschwitz. But what what was beyond this? What was behind these uh, things? And what happened to this angel of death after the the fall of the Nazi regime and uh, his life in South America? So it was, that's what I wanted to do. Another thing, uh, to come back to your first question, you asked me what, what I wanted to do exactly. I think I had, um, I had a kind of inspiration with the book of Truman Capote in A Cold Blood. I mean, the book was written uh, in 1965. When you read the book today, you have no idea what Capote invented or not. And actually, that's not the point. When you read the book, you understand the trajectory of the two murderers. 
And uh, it's, it's a fantastic portrait of two murderers. And this is what I had in mind. I wanted to describe the trajectory of Mengele in South America. Yeah, I think it's a good comparison. He, he called that book a, a non-fiction novel, I believe is the way he referred it. Exactly. We're, we're all turning around the same thing. It's, it's, it's an hybrid, something, something in between. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the point about sort of demythologizing, I think is a really potent one. There's, like, there's, I came into the book and I imagine most people did with an enormous amount of misapprehensions about Menga, but also about Nazi ex exiles in South America. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because of, like you say, this mythology that rose up around it. I mean, it's true that the name Angel of Death, I mean, it's it sounds extraordinarily glamorous almost, you know, you, you would, um, and that's something that you you work hard to really undercut. But another misapprehension that I think people might have or people might not know about uh, concerns the setting of South America, mm -hmm. uh, the nature of life for these escaped Nazis in hiding when they first arrived. I think a lot of people and myself included might have imagined these Nazis sort of, they, they went there, they were in hiding, they were everything was had to be completely clandestine they were sort of living in the forest you know they they had to completely change their identities and they could never be seen again but in fact you give a picture of argentina that not only did they not have to particularly hide they were welcomed they were encouraged to come they were uh, they were sort of they came together in groups they were they lived well, they were celebrated to some extent. Could you talk about um, the, the nature of Argentina at the time for, for these exiled Nazis? Sure, I mean, we all had in fact this, uh, this kind, this is again a, a kind of movie perception of realities and, uh, or something which happened after. But when all these guys arrived in the late 40s, early 50s, Argentina was, uh, not only Argentina, but especially Argentina. I'm talking about Argentina in the book because Mengele went to Argentina. It was a very welcoming place, I mean, for, for all these people. Um, for obvious reasons, um, Perón had a very clear vision of what he wanted. Uh, Perón had lived, had worked at the Argentinian embassy in Rome during the war. And he was kind of fascinated more by fascism than by Nazism. I mean, Italy and Argentina are so close societies. And uh, for him, the axis, Germany, Italy, Japan, were a kind of third block, uh, non-aligned, the first non-aligned blocks between the communists, the Soviet Union, and the capitalists, the Western democracies, America, England, France. And after the collapse of the axis, he thought that there was a future for this non-aligned bloc. And the power which would lead this bloc uh, would be very far from the US and from Soviet Russia. Because I mean, uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, everybody uh, had feared that there would be a nuclear war and that these two powers would disappear. So basically Argentina was very well placed for the first time in its history was at the end of the world and that was perfect. But Argentina lacked of everything, of scientists, of doctors, of uh, militaries and so on. And instead of forming these people and it takes one, two, three generations, well, they did their market in Europe. So they, they went and got the, some of the best specialists. The very best ones went to the US, <laughs> like von Braun and your, uh, and your uh, space program. But the other ones, most of them, lots of them, uh, not only, not all of them, but most of them uh, went to Argentina. That's how all these Nazis uh, went to, to this place. And for something like 10 years, they, have, uh, they had a very pleasant life. And uh, this is why I call the first part of the book, the Pasha. Mengele had a Pasha life in Buenos Aires. Okay, at the beginning it was difficult, but not because it was searched by anyone. Uh, it was difficult because he was an immigrant. It was at the end of the world. He didn't speak the, the language and he didn't know anyone. But after a few months, a few years, he had a very, very, very pleasant life. He had lots of money from the family, he was very rich, he even worked for the, the family business, this uh, agriculture machines all around South America. He had friends, money, girlfriends, he married again. And he was so confident that 
he had arrived under a pseudo, uh, Helmut Gregor. And then after a few years, he went to the German consulate very easily and said, well, I came under a false identity. I want to go back to my identity. My name is Joseph Mengele. And he got it. And if you had been in uh, Buenos Aires at the end of the 50s, you would have opened the phone book looking for Joseph Mengele. You would have found him. So, so easy was it. Then it changed. It changed after the capture of Aishan. And our imagination, the, the way we see all these stories, is perceived through the story of Eichmann. But this only happened in 1960, 15 years after the end of the war. Yeah. So it was a completely different world. Another thing which is very important, I think, and especially because we have the, the Holocaust Museum, the perception of the survivors of the camps completely changed over the time. In the 40s, in the late 40s, in the 50s, even in the 60s, the survivors were very, were very suspect. They were, they were strangely seen because why did this guy survive? Why did my mother not survive? Or my father or my cousin or my wife, what did he do? Did he cheat? Did he sleep? Did he betray? Did he pay? So we have this, I mean, the, the, the last ones are, are disappearing, unfortunately, and they are seen like uh, kind of secular saints since the last 20, 30 years. But at that time, it was the opposite. They were suspects, these people. So they didn't speak. Everyone was focused on the future. I mean, to reconstruct Europe or the Cold War and all these kind of things. So basically, these people had a very, very, very peaceful life uh, for something like 10, 15 years after, after the war. And this in is- fact, he, he, returned, he returned to Europe, in fact. Exactly, he traveled to Europe. He went to Switzerland, he had the nice uh, ski holidays in Switzerland. So he went back even to his hometown in Günzburg in Germany. And uh, he went through New York, actually, uh, Josef Mengele. So uh, that was what was going on in the 50s. And I think it was also something that was important, in fact, to understand, to understand the odyssey of uh, of Mengele in South America, I had to describe. And, and the way the book functions, it's like, again, I like this uh, movie comparison. Basically, you have a zoom. And sometimes, most of the times you follow Mengele, you're just behind his back. But sometimes the scene uh, uh, widens, the screen widens, and then to understand, in fact, the, the, the geopolitical context of the time. And that was very important. Otherwise, you can understand the story especially the Cold War in Europe, in South America, and also in the Middle East. Yeah. It seems to me that Mengele was slightly more uh, anxious or more nervous about, even in the good period, about uh, being discovered and being caught, because he seemed to have anticipated the turn that you said. And, and when Eichmann was, uh, was captured, he was, they, were, they were also hoping to capture him but he was gone at that point, right? He had he had seen it. Um, he's, uh, he was very cautious all the time, but he was not so cautious till he met Eichmann. And Eichmann spoke a lot because Eichmann was an has been at the time. Eichmann had, had been so big during the Nazi regime and he, he used to boast because he had a very, 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 very miserable life in Argentina was really a misfit Eichmann in Argentina. Everything he tried was, um, everything collapsed all the time. But it was a kind of an attraction. And he used to tell lots of stories that he had met all the big shots of the Nazi regime and Himmler and uh, Kalten Brunner and, and so on and so on. So, uh, you know, in this kind of uh, social gatherings, um, Eichmann attracted lots of attention and searched lots of attention. And Mengele was the opposite. First, because he, he didn't have this uh, great career as a Nazi. He was just a captain. He was just a doctor, a doctor, one doctor among thousands of doctors who worked in the concentration camps. Basically, he was a nobody in the Nazi regime compared to Eichmann. But Eichmann came, a very, came from a very poor social background. And he had um, studied Mengele, had two PhDs, came from a very rich family, uh, highly cultural, let's put it this way. So uh, the, both of them had lots of scorn for each other. And uh, you, 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 found, you find again the scorn in the 50s when they meet. So Mengele was always cautious because it's also something like 
It's very bourgeois, in fact, to be cautious, not to speak too much, to not to boast. Uh, Mengele was very self-centered, very egocentric, and all of this, but he didn't boast himself like like Eichmann, which was something like for um, from a, a lower uh, social class. This is going to take so that, as you say, his fortunes sort of change after this, and then the next section of the book, I think you I think you call it the rat right because exactly he, exactly he's essentially exactly. yeah he's got to live in hiding he's living as as an outlaw and yeah. his life becomes more and more uh, based and i want to talk about that especially in conjunction with this mythology that you mentioned but i i'm interested in you you mentioned mengele's character and his background and his character and this is a this is a it's a non-fiction novel but it's still it's still a narrative in which you have to inhabit the mind of a character mm -hmm. that seems like an extremely difficult thing to do with someone who you would enter the narrative already loathing with mm -hmm. you would feel loathing and, det and detestation for this person sort of our, our sense of of literary works of character and literary works are very rooted to psychology Often there's this sense that the deeper we get into them, we understand the ambiguities of people, we feel empathy for them. But all of this is sort of off the table when you're dealing with someone like Mengele. What was the nature of his character and how were you able to spend so much writing time with him, you know, thinking about him and with his point of view? Well, when I think um, about Mengele as a, as a person, not about what he did, but as a person, I, I would first think as, uh, as an opportunist, uh, in the sense that uh, when he was young, in the 30s, when he was in his 20s, uh, he was a conservative. He came from a conservative background. And he didn't enter the Nazi party very, very early. He entered the party in 1937 because he had understood that he wanted to, have, if he wanted to have a great career, he had to go through the party. And Mengele had understood that the Nazi regime was a biopolitics for the first time of history. That at the center of the regime, at the center of everything, was biology, medicine, races. And as a doctor, he he had the opportunity, in fact, to get into the center of this regime. So he entered the, the party in 37, and then he entered the SS in 38. But then Auschwitz happened, he entered Auschwitz in 43. What did he enter Auschwitz? He entered Auschwitz because it was the possibility for him to, uh, to dig into or to uh, practice these experiments, not on mice or uh, rabbits like any laboratories, but on human beings. And because he was searching the, the secrets of the twins, this is very true. I mean, we have to understand the importance of twins for the, the, the Nazi regime. I mean, the very idea was after the conquest of the East, I mean, after you got rid of the Jews, you got rid of most of the Slavs, you got rid of the gypsies, I mean, you had these empty spaces, huge empty spaces, and you had to populate these spaces. And the, the regime encouraged women, especially SS people, I mean, to have as many kids as possible, with as many women as possible. But that was not enough, sure. So basically, they were looking for the secrets of the twins. And the one who would find the secrets of the twin would be like the magician of the regime. And that's why they did so many research on twins. And that's why, and this is very Faustian. I mean, Mengele decides to go to Auschwitz to make these experiments in order to become a professor at the university after the war. So this is very opportunism. Then after the war, Mengele was protected by a system. Another thing which is extremely important, I think, to understand uh, that Mengele was not a crazy doctor. He was a very rational person within a crazy and murderous system. But the system encouraged him and protected him, in fact, to do what he did. This is very important. Mengele, I, I don't like the idea of the monster. I mean, yeah. he did monstrous things, to be very clear. Yeah. 
but the within a monstrous system. But what he did within these monstrous systems, these monstrous acts, were very rational in within the system. Within the system yeah. And and it was a, a little piece, a very long chain. I mean, everything he did was in accordance with doctors, professors, laboratories, museums all around Germany. And he sends all the eyes, the skeletons, everything you can imagine or, uh, or fear. I mean, to all these people and to all these laboratories and to all these science museums. So this is something which is important. After the collapse of this crazy system and modern system is nothing. It disappears somehow. And after the war, where you can see, it's it's a very mediocre man. It's a very self-centered, very narcissistic, uh, uh, very frustrated man, more and more frustrated. And this is something I wanted to depict. And this is, again, uh, very, very, very far from the popular representation of Mengele. And that was important. Also a man, effectively, with no conscience, really. He doesn't... He, he says repeatedly, no remorse, no regret. At I wouldn't say that. Okay. He has the conscience of a Nazi, of a Nazi doctor. Hmm. This for us is a no conscience. Right. He had this conscience. I mean, Mengele was uh, sure of himself and he considered himself as a, as, a, as a soldier of the German science and the German medicine of the time. Right. So he knew what he was doing, but of course he never had any remorse or any regret for what he had done. I mean, from our perspective, from a humanist perspective. Right. So, and but again, to to understand all of this, uh, you have to go back to the very ideology of the Nazi regime. Yeah. I mean, if you consider some human beings like mosquitoes, I mean, it's very easy to kill mosquitoes. And this is what he did. And he never regretted this because they had a aim, they had a aim, they had a goal, they had some, all these crazy things to achieve. That's why he did all of these terrible things. But uh, so it's another, it's another Weltanschau, it's another vision of the world. And that was also important to, to, to remind how it functioned, in fact. But no, again, yeah. even 30 years beyond, at no point did he start to question that, that ideology. Never ever. I mean, most of the Nazis never changed their minds about what they did. Uh, they were soldiers of Germany and they did their duties. When you read testimonies of all these uh, people arrested or tried, they all they all say the all say same. I mean, th that was the defense of Eichmann. He did what he had to do and what people asked him to do. And they, they never regretted, never ever. Mengele never ever regretted. And there is a crucial scene in the book when Mengele finally meets his son. Yeah, I wanted to mention that. At the end of the 70s. And uh, the son is a typical West German born uh, at the end of the war. So uh, this generation, again, the fathers and the uncles and so on. And he asks him all these questions. Why have you done this? Didn't you feel guilty? Don't you feel guilty? And all of this. And he doesn't regret anything. And this is not something I invented. What we didn't mention, what I didn't mention, that Mengele kept diaries for years and years. And so that was an important source, of, of course, of documentation. I mean, to, for me to know his, his mind, his, his, uh, his worldview. Yeah, the, the, the meeting with the sun is a, one of the most powerful parts of the book, I think. And it, it's partly because the sun actually is the sort of character that we sort of expect to find in, in literature in which he's very soul searching and he's very tortured and he's very ambivalent. And, and also ambiguous somehow. Yes. And he has all the ambiguities of the Germany of that time, of this generation, somehow. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and he's still alive. I mean, he's a yeah, he's a lawyer in Munich. He's a lawyer in Munich. Yeah, yeah. He changed his name, but uh, he's a lawyer in Munich. Yeah, yeah. It's an extraordinary scene. Well, that comes toward the end, and we we sort of mentioned the the turning point in Mengele's life, essentially when he became a hunted man. He really did become an outlaw, and he had to go in truly into hiding. Mm -hmm. um, and this is. It's it's a narratively it's extremely powerful it's extremely claustrophobic, and again 
like you say, it contradicts sort of the mythology of him being some sort of Bond-like supervillain. But I also think it, if you were to read the Wikipedia entry about him, you would see that he lived until 1979, which is an extraordinarily long time. So you would get, the, you would sort of think, well, he got away with it. He, mm -hmm. he, he, he won, he succeeded. He pulled the, he, you know, he, he, uh, everyone else was trying to find him and they couldn't. And he lived a relatively long life and he got away with it. But in fact, the sense of this book is that, uh, is one of the walls constantly closing in and his life becoming sort of increasingly more hellish and tormented. It's almost, everyone, people think of, um, like the film Downfall, you know, the last days of Hitler, where everything is nearing, everything is inevitable, the end is coming soon, you know, there's almost that feeling, even though he's in fact never caught and brought to justice, there's still a real sense of, of, uh, of everything sort of closing in on him and things becoming disastrous. Is that, that, uh, th that clearly is something that you got from the research, but it gives the it it gives the book an extraordinary sort of climactic power to some extent. But that's the difference between an essay and a narrative nonfiction or yeah. a fiction, uh, a nonfiction written like a fiction or whatever, however yeah. we call it. Uh, the the um, the narrative is completely different. And I mean, yeah, uh, Mengele lived for something like twenty years in an open air jail. And uh, even if he was not uh, searched and hunted for, for very long, uh, he, he felt, actually, he felt hunted for, for 20 years. And this feeling of loneliness, this, the man is getting crazy. He eats himself somehow. This loneliness, this paranoia, this, uh, this fear, in fact, I think was, um, was a kind of a punishment. And I think he suffered more in this jungle in Brazil all alone, uh, that if he had gone to, to a jail in Germany, I mean, if he had gone um, to jail in Germany, I mean, he could have proved that he was only a captain. He was a captain. He was not a major, he was not a general, he was not, um, it would have been different, of course, with the Israelis, but with the Germans, the family, extremely powerful, extremely rich, would have taken the best lawyer for him. So he would have stayed in pretty good conditions in a jail in Germany for five, 10, 15, maybe 20 years. And then he would have gone. He would have had a, a sweet life somehow. In Brazil, in Paraguay, when, when he has to flee and, and above all, this is the idea of the fear because you don't know your enemies. They don't have a face. So you feel all the time threatened. And he was extremely isolated, extremely. I mean, when I went to Brazil, uh, to, not to do some research, but just to, to see the places where he lived. That was very important for the topography of the novel. Uh, in Brazil, he lived with his Hungarian family, something like 10 years uh, in a farm completely isolated at the top of a hill. And he built a, a, a tower, in fact, to, 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 to look uh, all around, to, to search for the enemies. And I mean, Mengele came from a very rich family, from a very rich background, and very sweet life in Bavaria. And suddenly this guy has to live at the end of the world with a family that he really hates, completely isolated, completely alone, with the, the constant fear of being trapped or a coat like Eichmann. That was a that was a very interesting stuff for a novelist. I mean, based on realities, of course, and true facts and so on. I mean, this stuff is uh, was um, was very interesting to to describe and to 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 describe as a like in a novel. There's a there's a remarkable scene. Where I'm going to read a passage which is related to this, but I'm also thinking of a, a scene. He suddenly gets extremely sick. He's got some sort of stomach infection, and he doesn't know what it is. Goes to the hospital, and he discovers he's been because he's been chewing on his mustache, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, he had, uh, because he had to hide himself, well, that's what he thought, he, he had to hide himself. And uh, Mengele had a very, had a little space between the teeth. So he decided to grow a huge mustache, like a Nietzschean mustache, to, to hide it. But he was so nervous that he used to eat his mustache. And after uh, 10, 12, 15 years, he had eaten so much of the mustache that he got a ball of air 
in his stomach. And this is true. I mean, I, I didn't invent it. I, I, no one could invent such a thing. It would be too big, in fact. And uh, yeah, that's another example. But, but I have to say that I had a kind of schadenfreude. Uh, uh, I kind of enjoyed, we can surprise kind, I enjoyed torturing him somehow. Yeah. And this is why I would have never been able to write a novel about Mengele in Auschwitz. When, when I, I wrote a novel about the fall of Mengele. Right. And not only the fall, but uh, because at the beginning it was so easy in Argentina, that he really thought that it was more clever than anyone and that he had, he had managed to escape. He had right. done it somehow. And he was still very young at the time, he was 45, uh, 47. And then the fall starts. And for 20 years, I described the fall of this uh, mediocre uh, and terrible uh, criminal and murderer. I'm gonna read a very brief passage because like, as you say, these punishments, they have almost sort of a Dante-esque sort of ironic quality to them to some extent. And one of the punishments is simply living so long that the world changes and all the, ide all the ideologies and all the things that you sort of gave your life to are completely wiped away, are completely gone. Google this new generation, this post-war generation. Right, and this is something, uh, this is a passage that um, comes from that period when he's in Brazil living in this house with the tower on the hill. He's, he's, his health is not good. Uh, and it goes like this, helpless and shivering with cold in his ridiculous watchtower, he gazes at the blood moon camouflaged by inky rain clouds. That night in September 1967, Mengele senses that he has lost. He understands nothing of the world now, this world to which he no longer belongs, this world that reviles him as the devil's servant. All through the austral winter, he watches young Germans on television challenging the ancestral order discipline, hierarchy, authority, and demanding that their fathers explain themselves. He sees long-haired hippies dancing through the streets of San Francisco and making pilgrimages to Kathmandu. He stares in disbelief as white, as whites, at whites and blacks in America. He's disgusted by contemporary German artists and the first communes in Cologne, Munich, and West Berlin, by buoys and his social sculptures molded from coal, rubble, and rusted steel, by the Zero Group, by Richter and Kiefer, by the Viennese actionism of Bru, Muhl and Nietzsche, who lacerate their skin and smear blood on their canvases, and by psychedelic musicians who bury Wagnerian lyricism under wild waves of synthesizers, flutes, and percussion. Their cosmic dirges plumb the depths of the German soul and vent their despair by trampling the past. Haunted by the war, sculptors, painters, and musicians flee the Germany of slogans and euphemisms, of hypocrisy and lies, the despicable Germany that belonged to their predatory parents, the Germany of iconoclastic fury, the torture chamber, the quagmire of human sins, the Germany they associate with the right-hand panel of Bosque's triptych of the garden of earthly delights, with hell and Satan, the source of the great plague that has just ravaged Europe, its factories of death, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Mengele. That's a, I should say the translation, it's an excellent translation, it's by uh, Georgia de Chambray. Um, the book reads extremely fluently with an extremely forceful narrative line throughout. And that I think, I hope gives an example of it. I wanted to ask about that question of, of style when you're writing a book like this, because the question of, of style is kind of a, a fraught one when the subject matter is the Holocaust or the aftermath of the Holocaust. Um, you know, we think of the famous idea of Adorno that you can't, that poetry after the Holocaust is barbaric, that it's not. So how, how did you find the voice, the writing style, the writing voice that you needed to, to make this narrative work? And what, what did you hope to avoid and what was, what did you need to? to what I wanted to avoid was lyricism. Yes. Pathos. Yes. And uh, I wanted to write something pretty dry. Mm -hmm. Very few adjectives, no metaphor. And for many reasons. First, because it's a book about Josef Mengele. So there is no reason for any lyricism or metaphor or for the writer to take any pleasure, I would say. It has to be dry. Yeah. Secondly, because uh, this is, you can read the book like a, like a detective novel, like a thriller, like a, it's a spy novel to, and uh, so it has to go quick. I mean, the man is on the run. So basically you have to move quickly. 
you can't have long descriptions and long passages of Buenos Aires. And so you have to find the, the right word, the right adjective, in fact, to, uh, to, to, to describe. So in one word or in one sentence and not in one or two paragraphs or two pages. And uh, so this, this, I had this in mind very, at the beginning, very clearly in, in my other books, uh, which are most of them not translated into English, I always, most of them, I adapt my style of writing to the subjects, something completely different. I wrote a book about dribbling and soccer in Brazil. And I try uh, within my sentences, with the rhythm of the sentences to first find the rhythm of a soccer game and the rhythm of the Brazilian music of the time. So uh, this is a strong part of, uh, of my work and for the, the book about Mengele, it has, it has to go that way, sharp, quick, and above all, no pathos, no lyricism. I mean, when you write a book about a guy like Mengele, you don't need to, to emphasize what he did. You don't need to underline anything. Yeah. And one of the first things uh, my first editor told me, I mean, the reader is intelligent. You will feel, I mean, if you're good, it will feel. It's like movies. I hate movies when you have, you know, too much music. As if the, the, the movie director would tell you, you have to cry at that moment, or you have to laugh at that moment, or you have to do this and this and this. No, trust, 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 trust the reader, trust the... And uh, this is what I, what I try to do with, uh, especially with the rhythm, the rhythm of the sentences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say to the to the audience listening in that the, the translation captures it extremely forcefully. I mean, there's a real freight train momentum throughout the entire thing. It never dwells. It never becomes sentimental or treacly. No, 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 no. At the end of the book, you have this very short sort of peroration in which you, you talk about forgetfulness and you talk about history moves on and generations forget, which clearly sort of reinforces to some extent the point of why you've written this book mm -hmm. some element of remembrance is that is that was that part of your thinking is that part of the origins and inspiration throughout remember okay is an important thing for sure but i, I had other things uh, i think more important in my mind it was to to understand that it can happen again and again in the sense that as we said about Mengele, Mengele was a, a man without qualities somehow, very mediocre, very self-centered, very narcissistic. But at a certain point, this man, this non-interesting man, I would say, meets an ideology or an ideology and then a system, a regime, meets people like Mengele. And then this system, this regime, encourage, protects, and uh, these men without qualities to do incredible things. They were protected. And this is something which is very important, I think, to understand that it's, it's a very individual choice. Mengele had the chance not to go to Auschwitz. He decided to go to Auschwitz. He decided to do what he, he wanted to do. And this can happen again and again and under any latitude, under any regime and any totalitarian regime, of course. And this is a warning. This is a warning because in, at least in our Western societies, the fact that we were in contact with people who had lived this period of time, this period of history. So we, we lived in an environment where the warning was very strong, but this direct contact is disappearing now. And again, we see that for the last 10, 15 years, the atmosphere completely changed in the West completely changed. You don't have this warning again because all these voices are disappearing or have disappeared. And so we have to be we, we have to be extremely extremely careful because I think men, hum, humankinds are amazing creatures, but they're also able to do the worst. And Mengele is a good example. Mengele is a good example because as I said, this mediocre man uh, who love classical music, who love German literature, who had two PhDs, who come from this uh, bourgeois, rich background, who married a lady who studied uh, art history in Florence uh, in the 30s. This guy, this European bourgeois, sends 
400,000 people to the gas chambers and practicing experiments just a few years later. So this shows how far men can go when they are protected by an evil system. And this is more important, I would say, than memory. Memory is important. But yeah. I mean, for young people who read these books, I mean, they don't have these contacts anymore. We are the grandparents, we are the parents. For yeah. them, it's history, it's like the Civil War, it's like the First World War, the Middle Age, or whatever. But at least they can think about this. How far a man can go when, a, when an evil system uh, encourages and protects the words of us that's that, that was my main uh, and also because when i wrote the book that was in 2016 yeah it was in france and the context was terrible i mean this is that was the years that those were the years of charlie hebdo of the bataclan of what happened in nice i mean evil was again all around all around and uh so i think it it, it had a very strong impact on, on my work and at, at the time I'd, li I'd like to, I'm just going to ask one more uh, to the to the viewers, please, uh, we'll, we'll have some time for a Q&A, so if you'd like to ask any questions, please do. Um, as you say, you you wrote this in 2016, mm -hmm. so you've been discussing it all over the world, certainly in France and then all other places in the world for many years now. Mm -hmm. You have, what is your sense of the way people think about Mengele and the Holocaust now? Is it, were you surprised by uh, by how people responded to the book as you say there have been sort of waves at one point you discussed you know the world went through holocaust mania where suddenly media was extremely interested in in learning from it we can say that that's you know that has probably passed to some extent is it still in people's consciousness is it still something people think about are they surprised when they when they read a book like this do you have any sense of what the what the what, the, what i would say that i mean I had a very long tour in Germany. I went maybe to 60 cities in Germany. So uh, I met many people. And uh, what I write would have been contro controversial 20 years ago. This is not more controversial because even the people who live the 50s, the 60s, I'm not even talking about the war. They're all very old now. And time went on and Germany has other priorities, even if they still respect the, the, the memory of this. and. I think this uh, what what uh, struck me in fact when I did this tour, I presented the book in China, in Japan, in South America, North America, all over Europe, and and so on in Israel. Uh, the reactions were not so different. It was people who were interested by this story, or by the Second World War, or by but there was. It's not. I mean, it's history now. And mm -hmm. this is something that I really understood when uh, presenting this, this book all around the world. Yeah, no, I think it's part of the power of the book. Like you say, it's history, but a purely historical treatment is invaluable, but also is not, there's a certain, dry, it's, a certain it's dryness history. to it. It doesn't come to life for people. No, but it's history written at the, at the present. Yeah. And uh, th that was something which was very important for me to, to describe the book as if we were really behind him, as if we we're leaving uh, this, these episodes from the 40s till the 1990s. Um, we have some, a, a few uh, good questions from, uh, from listeners. Um, uh, let's see, uh, is, uh, this is something you mentioned, but maybe we can expand on it. Is the Nazi dentist in the novel and film Marathon Man based on Mengele? And do you have any opinion about that fictional portrayal? You mentioned it, but maybe you can uh, elaborate. I mean, it's a good, uh, it's a good fiction, but it's a true fiction. And it represents exactly the, the mood of the 70s, of the late 70s, where, when there was this kind of Holocaust mania, where everyone was talking about this, and because more and more talk about this, and more and more books, and more and more testimonies, and new interests, especially in America. I mean, America needed something like 30 years, in fact, to, to get really into the, the, the story. Uh, so Marathon Man is very symbolic and it's a, it's a good movie. I mean, Dustin Hoffman is amazing and uh, Laurence Olivier is also amazing, but it's a, it's a true fiction of the 70s. I mean, I, I love the 70s and I love the 70s in New York and I love all of this. So I enjoy myself. I, I watch it again to, to prepare the book, but it's a, it's a fantasy. Yeah. It's a good fantasy. Yeah. Um, but they had in mind Mengele. They didn't mind Mengele when they when they wrote the script and when they did yeah, the movie. I think I think clearly. 
Actually, um, I book to Dustin Hoffman. I'm thinking about this now. Huh. Maybe. Um, a, a good question here. This is something that's brought up in the book. He says, uh, the question is, I have read that at some point the Mossad no longer prioritized his capture. Can you speak to this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, some of the main plots of the books and what the Israelis did. And they were very close to get him after um, after the, the capture of Eichmann. But then this is also a book about real politics. And it's also a book about what is the Mossad. The Mossad is not the secret services of the Jews abroad, or the secret services of the memory of the Jews, it's the secret services of the state of Israel. And in the 60s, well, they had to uh, first, it's a very weird story, a little boy disappeared. And for people who haven't read the book, I won't say so much, but this uh, domestic priority became more important than the search for Mengele. And then, I mean, they had to prepare the war of 67. So the main focus was, of course, the Arabic war, not uh, an old Nazi in, uh, in Brazil. Plus, again, about real politics. I mean, the capture of Eichmann in Argentina uh, was condemned, strongly condemned by many, many, many states in the world oh, really? because uh, it was, uh, the Israelis didn't respect the sovereignty of Argentina. You don't, you don't play with sovereignties of states. And Israel needed the voices of many states, especially the third American states at the UN Council. So basically, it would have been very difficult to do exactly the same with Brazil, with Mengele. So this is another reason why it didn't happen. And for the rest, I let you read the, the book and the, the chapters dedicated to the, the Mossad question. Yeah. Um, uh, a good question. Was, was Mengele ever involved in practicing medicine post-war? Well, he practiced some uh, abortions in Argentina and a few other things. But again, the, yes, I, I mentioned all of this in the, in the book. I mean, it's part of the... But Mengele never produced uh, twins in the south of Brazil. I mean, there are also lots of books and all the fantasy that suddenly you had lots of little blondes, uh, guys and, and, uh, and girls uh, in the south of Brazil. This is also uh, completely, completely, completely false. Um. Uh, another good, um, j just sort of a useful specific question. I understand Mengele drowned. Was he not a swimmer? How did his death happen? It's addressed in the book. Well, he was 68, he was in a bad shape and above all, he didn't have any reason to live anymore. It was a very sad, uh, long, uh, lonely, paranoiac and uh, old man. So, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a physician. Uh, this is what happened. He, he had a kind of an attack in, in the sea and he, and he died that way. There's a, an interesting uh, uh, sort of nuanced question here. If Mengele felt strongly he had done nothing wrong, why did he have to hide? Perhaps not in the, in the sense of he had to hide because he was being hunted, but what were the dynamics in his mind related to this? He felt, he knew that people were after him, but he felt he had done nothing wrong. So that, that sort of informs he his person. He felt that it was very unfair what was happening to him because also most of his colleagues had a very sweet life in Germany. His professors had a very sweet life. They, they came back to universities and they taught again and, he had the feeling that he was the only one uh, lost in uh, South America, in, uh, in the jungle. And this is why also the book is called The Disappearance of Joseph Mengele, because mm -hmm. he really disappeared, but he also disappeared for himself. Yeah. Also because he always have to change of identities. Yeah. That's why I use always the pseudos of the time in the book. Right. I don't write Mengele from the beginning to the end. I only use Mengele when he recovers his identity, when people speak about him. Otherwise, I always use the, the pseudos because, again, we're, we're describing and describing the, the hunting of Mengele or the, his, his idea of being hunted. Yeah. And the, the, the degree of self pity that he felt for himself was part of the reason that also he was so lonely, just because he was an unbelievably unpleasant person to be around because he just exactly. did nothing but complain for essentially exactly. the last 20 years of his life. Very self centered man very narcissistic, very, so, 
yeah, I, I couldn't feel any empathy for this uh, awful, uh, awful old man. Uh, it has someone asked, where is the family now? The family is still uh, well. The 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 son is in uh, Munich. He's a lawyer in Munich, and uh, there are still nephews. And people were in the book. I mean, people were characters in the book. They they still live in uh, in Gunsburg, a little Bavarian town northwest of uh, Bavaria. But the family business is, uh, is has gone now. Is that correct? The family business is gone. It was sold and uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we have a question. Did the Odessa organization actually exist as usually depicted? It did. Some, it, an organization existed. It, it was not a centralized organization that we could imagine, but it existed. I mean, there were all these webs of connections and people helping each other and, and so on. This existed. There is a very good book by an Argentinian historian, a friend of mine called Uki Goini. And it's called uh, the Odessa, the Odessa file, or something like that. The true story of Odessa. It's, uh, it's very good. There's, there's, there's one more, which I think is a, a good one to end on. Um, it says, "Thank you for warning us that such people can evolve under under some governing, under certain conditions." Uh, hope to read more of your books. Are other books being translated uh, of yours? I know yeah. you have. A I, 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 have to, I have a book about the story of the Jews in Germany after the after the war, which might be translated. But uh, I, I've I've written books which are extremely different from one to from one to each other, from one to other. Uh, I don't want to stick. But an important thing we didn't say that this book about Mengele is the last part of a trilogy. The first part is the book about the Jews in Germany after the war. Okay. So this movie about Fritz Bauer, the, the famous German prosecutor, uh, who in fact discovered Eichmann in Argentina and who worked in collaboration with the Mossad, gave the tip to the Mossad. And uh, so to prepare the book, I had to read lots of, lots of things about Argentina. This is how I decided to write the same story as the L'Impossible Retour, so the story, the post-war story of Germany and Europe. But not from a victim perspective, this time, but from a murderer perspective. So this is a this is a full piece. I mean, the, the movie and the and the two books. So I hope they're going to be. I hope so too. Into English. Yeah, I hope so too, because they would make a, a meaningful trilogy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's been terrific. Um, Mom, thank you so much. Yeah. I hope I, we we meet. We have a drink together one day. I hope I hope we get to do it too. We get to do something in person as well. Again, I encourage everyone get the book. It's very short. It's completely memorable, and uh, I think you get a sense of the quality of the writing and the quality of the thinking that went into it. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you.